welcome everyone to our lecture today, to our lecture by Alan Levinson of the University of Oklahoma. <clears throat> before we start, before we start, I would like to mention the last event of the year at the Schusterman Center, which will be a lecture by Ben Schreier of Penn State, The Rise and Fall of Jewish American Literature, A Brief World History. It's in this same room. It's at 12 p.m. on Monday, April 15th. Monday, April 15th at 12 noon in, in this same room. So today, Alan Levinson, um, this is a, one of the events sponsored by the Gale Collaborative of Jewish Life in the Americas, which is an initiative here at the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies, co-directed by myself, I'm Naomi Lindstrom, and this individual, Bob Abzug, <laughs> is co-director. OK, you're being named as co-director. <laughs> OK, uh, so getting back to our speaker, Alan Levinson. He's the Schusterman Josie Chair of Jewish History at the University of Oklahoma. He's the director of the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at OU. And he's the author of, well, a number of things, The Making of the Modern Jewish Bible Between Philo-Semitism and Anti-Semitism, An Introduction to Modern Jewish Thinkers, Joseph, Portraits Through the Ages, and numerous essays on the modern Jewish experience. He has pedagogical articles. And one thing that he's especially explored is the fate of the Hebrew Bible uh, since the Enlightenment. And what he likes to do most professionally is to teach his courses Judaism, Genesis through Jewish Eyes, which he's teaching this semester, and the Bible since the Enlightenment. Uh, as many of you know, Alan has been very eager to forge links between the Schusterman Center here at UT and the one at OU. We've had get-togethers at the World Congress for Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, at the Association for Jewish Studies. And so part of his aim in being here is to meet people uh, associated with the Schusterman Center and talk about a possible conference on small town yes. Jewish life. Yes. Okay, so that might be in the works. Uh, a look through Alan's CV confirms my hunch that he has written about a vast number of topics, taught courses on many themes, but they all have some connection to Jewish studies. And sometimes the link is an unexpected one. His article on Thomas Mann as a practitioner of Midrash, and apparently he knew his stuff? Yes, he did. He did, OK. Well, I need to read that article. He's, uh, so Alan has written encyclopedia articles, which are actually quite difficult to compose, uh, articles about teaching Jewish studies on German, US Jewish culture, intermarriage, Conversion, orthodoxy, reform, secularism, apostasy, philo-Semitism, anti-Semitism, and many, many other topics, which I'd run out of breath if I tried to do justice. One of his goals appears to be to bring renewed attention to bear on Jewish thinkers who have fallen into obscurity, but who he believes to be deserving of a fresh read. And I believe that's what you're going to try to convince us in the case of Absolutely. Morris OK. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very, uh, very honored and very glad to be here with you today. Um, it's uh, uh, what Naomi says about trying to forge bonds about, uh, between the two Schusterman centers is not only true, but she is uh, not giving herself enough credit. And uh, Naomi has become really a friend and a collaborator over the last few years, and I want to thank her. Uh, for that very much. Uh, and I want to thank other people here, too. Um, uh, I, I don't have enough time to thank everybody, but uh, uh, Bob uh, Abzo gave me some great advice when I started as director of the OU Center uh, in Oklahoma. We're about to celebrate our 25th year of Jewish studies in Oklahoma, and I'm appreciative to Bob uh, on a train ride uh, not that long ago from the uh, AJS, I think Itzik gave me the ins and outs of uh, Yiddishism in the Bronx, which uh, I was, came from the Bronx too, but uh, I guess in a different part, the wrong part. And uh, I'm glad uh, to see my friend Andrew Porwancher, who's here. And yeah, I'm good. He's, you get an excuse for not being at Seder this year, because I can see you're really here, but otherwise you would be in trouble. Um, uh, so anyway, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. 
uh, uh, to me talk for maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes about uh, uh, Morris Samuel. I, Morris or Maurice or Moish. He went by all three. I have different accounts from family members, from uh, 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 autobiographies of Meyer Weisskal and other early journalist Zionists who called him Moish. Uh, the Yiddish circle called him that. And, uh, and Morris, which is the English pronunciation of that word, that first name, uh, he was also used. So now I have a character whose first name I, I can't pronounce properly, uh, which uh, is not going to stop me for a minute. Um, so, uh, uh, and to uh, try to attract a few more people, Naomi wisely suggested I focus on only one area of Samuel's uh, work, which is his um, well-known books on uh, anti-Semitism uh, written from really from 1940 to the mid-1960s. But I'm going to do this in three stages. I'm going to talk a little bit about his biography, because uh, it's an interesting one. I'm going to talk a little bit about his overall accomplishment. I consider him to be the last Jewish generalist, which to me is a, a, a compliment, not a derogation. And I'm going to then focus a little bit on his interesting views about uh, uh, Jew hatred, uh, which uh, I'm afraid to say is still a very relevant topic. Uh, okay, in his uh, 1963 autobiography, um, uh, Samuel, uh, Samuel, Samuel wrote uh, uh, that he was once introduced uh, by the uh, chair of the event at a synagogue. He spoke at a lot of synagogues, Jewish JCCs, churches, and introduced him. We've brought, uh, I won't take too long to uh, introduce today's speaker who is known in America and also in the Bronx. Um, uh, I will not bore you because we've brought him here for that occasion, uh, which uh, Samuel thought was a pretty funny introduction. Uh, Samuel, uh, uh, Samuel has fallen down the memory hole and before I explain in my last slide why he has fallen down, or at least speculate on why he's fallen down the memory hole, I have to first convince you uh, that he doesn't deserve to be forgotten. Uh, and uh, just um, for starters, uh, Samuel wrote 28 uh, books of nonfiction, six novels translated, uh, over 20 important works from the Yiddish, the German, the French, and the Hebrew, including, I might mention, since it's the right time of year, a Passover Haggadah. Uh, so his, uh, his uh, output is just uh, extraordinary uh, literary output. And in the 1940s and 1950s, he might have been one of the most sought-after Jewish speakers in the country. Uh, Robert Alter, who I'm sure a lot of you know, probably the preeminent scholar of biblical narrative in America. Uh, Robert Walter wrote a, a very laudatory uh, article on Samuel in commentary in 1964, saying for the last 20 years, Morris Samuel has been a one-man Jewish adult education uh, enterprise. And I think that Walter, as usual, nailed it on the head. So uh, we're talking about somebody who isn't so well known anymore, but if you said in the 1950s to the 1960s, have you ever heard of Morris Samuel? The answer would have been sure. Uh, heard him speak at Temple Fill in the Dot just last year or the year before, and he did the, he did the circuit. I actually, in, I'm, I'm doing this as a, a short book project, so any suggestions or uh, criticisms will be very welcome when we get to the Q&A period. Uh, but one of the things I've been able to reconstruct is the way he earned a living, which I think is very interesting. He wasn't a professor. Uh, he wasn't a rabbi. Um, uh, uh, he basically wrote these books, uh, got some uh, royalties and advances for these books. He got uh, pretty well paid as a translator. Uh, but most of all, he earned his money. Uh, he earned his money on the lecture circuit. And I have little black, I've looked at, examined little black journals that he kept of where he went, who he met, what temple or synagogue or JCC he spoke, how much he got paid. And I have these, a run of these from 1950 to mid-1960s, sort of the height of his career. Uh, and they're in a, in a 
in a, for those of you who are historians, you know what a Hollander box is? And even though some of you who do other fields, some, some people are nodding. There are these little boxes that are old fashioned, used in old fashioned archives. And there's a whole box at uh, the American Jewish Archive in Cincinnati full of Morris Samuel's little year by year notebooks. So you can really reconstruct where he was and how he earned a living. Okay, so uh, uh, he, uh, uh, Samuel, uh, I, I won't. I won't spend too much time in the biography. I'll just say that he grew up in Manchester, England. He uh, came to America as a pacifist and a socialist. He wanted to avoid conscription, which he correctly saw was just around the corner in England. Uh, he came to America and then, after a couple of years in America, actually volunteered for the Allied Expeditionary Force. He was not in the trenches. He worked in Bordeaux, which is a pretty good uh, place to be stationed, I think, if you're going to be in France. And he, uh, he was in intelligence because his French was perfect and his Yiddish was already very good. And so he worked as a translator and worked in intelligence. Um, uh, he also stayed on after he was decommissioned and worked in the Morgenthau Commission, which was in, uh, investigating Polish violence against Jews right after the end of the First World War. And this is probably where he both got some of his very strong feelings about um, Jew hatred, anti-Semitism, those, I'll use either of those words. We can parse that later if you really want. Or, um, and also his uh, somewhat uh, contempt for uh, American, the American Jewish establishment because he thought, frankly, Ambassador Morgenthau was wealthy but uh, didn't have much between the ears. Um, so uh, that was his early life. And, and now I'm going to talk uh, uh, in a, three quick slides about his uh, three wives. Um, the first uh, one, everybody, <laughs> everybody over 50 will recognize, and some maybe some under 50 will recognize the woman on the left. That is Golda Meir. Uh, this is a great picture with Marie Serkin. Uh, Serkin herself was a, a serious intellectual, uh, one of uh, a group of intellectuals that uh, a scholar uh, named Carol Kestner, now retired from New York Stony Brook, called the other New York intellectuals, not the f ones who edited Commentary or Dissent, uh, the Irving Howes and the Lionel Trellings, but the deeply rooted Jews, mainly from New York, who, um, who were uh, very important intellectuals and, and started from a Jewish point of view, Serkin and, uh, and uh, Samuel fell deeply in love in the summer of 1915 on the Jersey Shore. They, uh, uh, they had a romantic engagement. They eloped. They got married. And then Mary's father, Nachman Serkin, a famous Zionist, uh, labor Zionist, socialist Zionist uh, a figure who is now also largely forgotten, I think, outside of uh, people who study the history of labor Zionism, he forced them to get a divorce, or I think actually an annulment. And the two of them never really, uh, uh, I think they never really moved on entirely, and they had an affair over, off and on again over the years. And uh, Serkin uh, wrote a, a number of wonderful books, and most famous by far, Blessed is the Match, and I always think if those two had stayed together, it would have been another really interesting Jewish power couple intellectually, but uh, they didn't. Okay. Uh, the, for the longest period, and I think this photo already says quite a lot, <laughs> um, for the longest period of uh, Morris's uh, life, he was married to Gertrude Kahn, um, a, a distant cousin, uh, and uh, uh, except for one letter to the editor of the Menorah Journal, which was in the 19-teens and 20s, a pretty well-known journal in American Jewish life, edited by Henry Hurwitz, um, we have a letter from Gertrude saying, um, we're enjoying it in Palestine. This is from, dated from 1929. The kids have already, within a year, picked up fluent Hebrew. 
and uh, we wouldn't go anywhere else. Well, that turns out not to be true. Uh, they relocated back in the U.S., although Morris and Gertrude's son, Gershon, wound up going back to Jerusalem, and, and he started a bookstore in the old city, which is still owned by the family. Uh, uh, but uh, they were married for 40 years. I don't think it was a love match. Um, there's almost nothing in the archival record about Gertrude Kahn. I don't know if that's because uh, Samuel just didn't save anything or if his third wife purged it. Um, I think that's a toss of the coin, uh, uh, but uh, we, I, I can't tell you too much about Gertrude. I would like to tell you just a word or two about uh, wife number three, uh, uh, Edith uh, Bratsky Samuel, who was, again, uh, like uh, his first love, a very accomplished um, writer. She edited uh, a Jewish youth magazine for the reform movement called Keeping Posted. It was very well known uh, at the time, you know, distributed freely. She was the editor of this for a couple of decades, and she took it upon herself in Samuel, they married in 62, uh, and he died in 72. For the last decade of Samuel's life, she really dedicated herself to getting reissues of his books that had fallen out of print and making sure that he had a schedule that was uh, bearable because the schedule he kept up for his middle years, I still, I look at these journals, I don't know how he did it, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just speaking all over the country, taking railroad, uh, you know, railroad and then later plane trips everywhere. She organized his life. And then really, uh, most importantly, from my selfish point of view, uh, she herself deserves a study. Um, uh, 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 there's a, a, a professor who teaches at the College of Worcester who's hopefully going to do a little work on Edith Brodsky Samuel because she was a, a figure in her own right. But from my selfish point of view, the most important thing she did <laughs> was collect all of Samuel's literary remains, correspondence, book contracts, notes, uh, a, library, a list of his library holdings so we know what he had in his apartment and had it ready access, uh, and uh, essentially shipped it all to the American Jewish Archive in Cincinnati. And so there are 36 Hollander boxes, there's that term again, of material from Morris Samuel over and above the 28 published books and the 22 translations. And thank, she's really in some ways the person I have to thank, although of course she's long gone too, because without her, I don't think I could have done uh, the sort of short intellectual biography I want to do uh, about Samuel. So I'm deeply in her debt. Okay. That's about all I'm going to say about Samuel's biography, unless you want to ask me more later, uh, or, or now. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. The, 40, the, the, the marriage of 40 years, did, did they both die, or did they? No, they divorced ultimately in 1961. And, um, uh, and, and I've been in contact with Samuel's relatives, and they said, oh, don't talk about it too much, but you're right. <laughs> and I won't, because I, in the end, that's not, you know, uh, you know, whether happy or unhappy, that somebody's marriage, I don't think is of that great historical interest. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm pretty confident. You know, where is that bookstore in Jerusalem? Oh, it's, you know where the Cardo is? That central uh, street running uh, from the Arab Shuk, the Shuk Road, all the way out um, to where the big parking lot is now? Well, it's there. It's on, it's on, I guess, I'm not sure. The side not closest to the Western Wall, the side furthest from the Western Wall. And it's, I, I don't I forget the name of the bookstore. I haven't been to Israel in a little, little bit. Next time I go, I'll take a picture. But, is it, but Gershon Samuel passed away too, so it's now in the family, but not from people who have a direct memory of Samuel. I spoke to two of his grandchildren one who lives in New York, and one who lives in Israel. And so I've been in correspondence with them. Thankfully, somebody in that family did a family memoir, which gave me all sorts of wonderful information. So I have a family, you know, it's not published, of course. It's a family memoir, but they shared it with me. And um, Dave, I don't want to go into this too much. David Rapkin, who uh, is a businessman, and his 
His father was a major designer for Mayor John Lindsay in New York, and he was a professor of architecture, I think at NYU or maybe Hunter, somewhere very uh, prestigious, and he talked to me quite a bit about his grandfather. One of the things that Edith did was to say enough of this living out of a hotel, which Samuel had done out of the Hotel Berkeley for about 30 years and said, we're going to buy an apartment on the Upper West Side. And that's what they did. So um, she also kind of domesticated Samuel. He was already in his 60s, but he still needed domestication. And, um, and so I spoke, um, uh, I spoke to David Rapkin, who remembers getting French lessons from his grandfather, Morris Samuel, in their apartment on the Upper West Side. So. Okay, you know what, let me go ahead, and then as you can see, there's probably not a question about this that I'm not gonna wanna answer at enormous length, uh, uh, too great length. So let's, uh, let me just start uh, by, by, uh, uh, by the 1920s, Samuel was already decently well known. He had been working for about a decade um, for the World Zionist Organization in the New York branch. Uh, he was a Zionist publicist. I have some uh, fun posters from him giving speeches in various parts of New York. He was a publicist for essentially socialist, labor, cultural, Zionist. He gave these talks mainly in English. Uh, and he wanted to be more famous. He was a young man, and he wrote some very, very provocative, one could say um, uh, obnoxious uh, books, uh, You Gentiles, I the Jew, which I don't know why I didn't put a picture of this, Jews on Approval, uh, the last of the three, Jews on Approval, took, took aim at the American Jewish uh, leadership of the 1920s. And uh, really, I think what he was most angry about was the salaries that some of these superstar rabbis were pulling down in places like Cleveland. He devotes at least two or three pages to attacking Abel L. Silver. I think he also just didn't like the um, panting Americanization of American Jewry on that theme, we can talk more because I'm sort of in sympathy with Samuel on that one. But it's an obnoxious book. So, are, so is I the Jew. And so, above all, is You Gentiles, uh, in which he really says a bunch of um, uh, uh, fairly obnoxious things about non-Jews and non-Jewish life. Uh, and I'll just say, uh, I'll, but it gave him a sort of a, a, st a starting point for a more intelligent and mature treatment, which we'll come to momentarily. I will say this, that I couldn't, I, after I got it on ILL, um, those of you who are, I'm glad there are so many students here. When you get into this, you'll, you'll find out that sometimes just having a book for a few weeks and then having to return it, if you're seriously engaged in a project, is just not going to cut it, and you want to own a copy. So I didn't succeed to order a hard copy of this, but I did succeed in downloading one on the Kindle and then discovered to my horror that, and, and uh, this is just the, the weirdnesses of, of uh, book world, this turns out to be a republication of this book by an alt-right um, publishing company called Astara, and it's heavily annotated uh, with um, fairly vile anti-Semitic comments. <laughs> Um, by uh, who, R R Edward Horst, whoever that is, and I really don't care. Um, uh, but so it, it's interesting that the first thing that you can download, check me out on Amazon Kindle for you Gentiles, will be this actually alt-right annotated version. It's, a, it's an unfortunate book. Okay, uh, by the 40s and 50s, uh, Samuel had matured greatly. I think as a thinker, I, as a writer, and this is just the selection of books that I plopped up today because these are the ones that all deal in one way or another with anti-Semitism uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the Great Hatred, published in 1940, uh, The Professor and the Fo Fossil, An Attack on the Historian Arnold Toynbee, which we'll come back to shortly, uh, published in 56, and 10 years later, in 66, Blood Accusation, The Strange History of the Mendel Bayless Case. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mendel Bayless was accused of ritual murder in 1911, uh, tried and, and, and 
sort of ex convicted, sort of exonerated in 1913. It was a very, very famous anti-Semitic affair. Uh, and he decided to write about that in the, in the mid-1960s. So before I get into these books, let me say just a few things if you're interested in the other arenas of Samuel's work. And I, I promise to be very quick about it. But I, th I don't think I should skip it altogether. First of all, he was an important Zionist. He was, uh, a, a, he never, he wrote about five books on uh, Zionism and Israel, what happened in Palestine, 1929, uh, on the rim of the wilderness, 1931, uh, Harvest in the Desert, 1944, which was actually a very successful book that was done in conjunction with Jewish Publication Society. You could probably find it at your, tech, at your Hillel right here. I wouldn't be surprised. There was one at OU's, I checked. And then um, a couple of more critical books later in his uh, life uh, 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 that were uh, uh, really, uh, really questioning the Israeli policies in the 50s and the 60s. He didn't favor unlimited immigration, which Ben-Gurion was quite insistent upon. And in 1968, the last book he wrote, Light on Israel is actually a fairly critical uh, treatment of Israel's, um, uh, 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 the way it was going to deal with the occupied territories. And I have to say, he predicted pretty accurately it was going to be a challenge for Israel uh, in terms of its democratic nature to hold on to this large um, uh, Palestinian Arab population. So uh, as you can see for yourselves, he wrote on Zionism for a good 40 years. And he actually, be, I, I, you know, his one steady job, to be honest, in his whole life was working for the World Zionist Organization for 10 years, uh, which I think he had a very good time. He hung out with Shmar Yahu Levin, who was a, a, a character and a half, one of the great orators in Yiddish, Hebrew, English. He looks a little like Mephistopheles, but he was a great speaker. And Chaim Weitzman, and actually uh, Weitzman was his her Samuel's hero, his uh, mentor to some degree. And, I'm sorry, in case you don't know, Chaim Weitzman was the first president of the state of Israel, but maybe more importantly, the leading figure in world Zionism for a number of decades from before the Balfour Declaration of 1917, right up until the 1930s when the action shifted from the world stage to what was going on more specifically in Palestine, British mandatory Palestine. And uh, actually, one, one little, one tiny digression here uh, of a sentence. He was the one who helped Weizmann finish his uh, autobiography. In other words, Chaim Weizmann uh, wrote a wonderful autobiography called Trial and Error. And one of the reasons it's so wonderful is that Morris Samuel wrote it. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Weiss Weissman was a, 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 a wonderful figure, but his English prose was good, not excellent. Samuels was wonderful, and he wrote a good bit of the first half and rewrote a, a most, wrote most of the second half. And um, I confirmed this with Yehuda Reinhardt's the ultimate Weizmann authority, and, uh, and uh, Professor Reinhardt said, yeah, that's about right. Nobody wants to talk about that, though, so I won't either. I just mentioned it here. Uh, but if you ever want to read a very good autobiography, whoever wrote it, Chaim Weizmann, Trial and Error. It's a terrific book, uh, or a couple of books. OK, another thing, and, and here I'm speaking in, in front of a, man, a true master, but um, uh, one of uh, Samuel's great accomplishments, and if he hadn't done anything else and he had only done this, Dianu, it would have been enough, and, and that was uh, he was one of the more important translators of Yiddish writers. Uh, uh, his book, The World of Sholem Aleichem, which came out just 1943, just as European Jewry was being exterminated, killed, murdered by the Nazis. And then five years later, a book that didn't win quite as high plaudits, but I, I think is just as good, uh, Yud Lamed Peretz, Prince of the Ghetto. Uh, he, uh, he wrote these books, which are adaptations of uh, two of the three great Yiddish uh, uh, masters, early masters. 
Uh, and uh, these were both, uh, both books that sold very well and really acquainted a lot of people with Sholem Alechem. The, in case it, it, you are really unfamiliar with this world, let me just say that without Sholem Alechem becoming part of American culture, you wouldn't know about Fiddler on the Roof. So if I had to oversell my subject, I would say, no Samuel, no Tevya. <laughs> it's a bit of an oversell, but not so, ver not so much. And, and, and he did a bunch of other things with regard to Yiddish literature that he gets less credit for, but are also, I think, pretty important. Shalom Ash, uh, who wrote many, many great, uh, uh, or, or many, many popular novels, or maybe that's better than great, including uh, the Nazarene trilogy uh, about Jesus as a Jew. Very interesting. Uh, uh, Samuel translated those. Um, he translated um, uh, uh, the first uh, translations of Israel Joshua Singer, uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer's older brother. He translated a couple of Israel Joshua Singer's works. And again, um, he did translate from French, from German, from Hebrew, but his great claim as a translator was from Yiddish. And, and it was just in the, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, it was almost taken for granted that if you had a Yiddish writer that you needed translating and you really wanted it to, to hit with an American audience, Samuel was your, was your translator of choice. And it was sort of like Hillel Halkin in Hebrew a generation ago. Um, not that he's not still, you know, still a great translator, but now there are many great Hebrew to English translators. So I, 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 I don't want to talk about this today, but I don't want to skip it either. I will say finally, uh, uh, in yet another domain, uh, the Bible, uh, Samuel gets, uh, I'm not, I didn't even make a slide because I knew my time was limited. Um, Samuel is, uh, wrote a great book uh, called Certain People of the Book. And more importantly, he had 20 years of radio conversations with a Columbia professor named Mark Van Doren, a very, very well-known American poet. You can Google him and you'll see a zillion things on Mark Van Doren. Uh, uh, and they had, for almost 20 years, uh, weekly summer discussions on the narrative quality of the Bible, and those tapes still exist. You can go hear them in Cincinnati. You can hear M Mark Van Doren's highly educated, polished Midwestern. He came from, I think, Iowa or some, some Midwestern place. I should be better at that now that I've been in Oklahoma for 10 years, but I'm uh, not. Uh, and, and you can hear um, Morris Samuels, highly educated English, but more, I would say, European than English, highly educated voice. And they both had read and knew the whole corpus of um, modern English classics. And they quoted them to each other. And Samuel would quote this midrash. And Mark Van Doren would quote this poem from the 17th century English poets. They're just amazingly good conversations. And I just don't have time to talk about them now. But that gets a whole chapter in the book. OK, so uh, what I want to now do for another 10 minutes or so, and I won't be too much longer than that, is just talk about these um, books that deal with Samuel as a polemicist. Um, and I think I'll just skip this slide and go to each particular slide. Uh, uh, and uh, in The Great Hatred, which he published in 1940, and I want to emphasize that in the 1930s, and I have more work to do on this, it seems to me that with the exception of a few people who realized that anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, was central to the Nazi ideology, that was not the general take. In other words, it was obscene, I think, mainly as a battle of fascism versus democratism or liberalism, if you prefer. And the Nazi ideology was seen as a barbar bar barbaric and reactionary force. But the centrality of the Jewish issue to Nazism did not seem so obvious to that many writers. There are some exceptions. 
Samuel was completely clear about this. He said, we are a world at war. And you can read the quote for yourself in the interest of time. I won't read it. But basically, he said, there is Judeo-Christianity, and, and I'll get into this a little more, animated by the prophetic ethic, the, eth the ethos of doing right, of doing what God wants us to do. And then there is the, what he would call later, he, here he calls it Nazism, fascism, in the gentleman and the Jew. He'll refine that term a little bit and call it the force, of philo the force philosophy. In other words, a sort of a vitalist lust for power and lust for domination. And he said, these are the two forces that are at war in our world right now. Again, he publishes this in 1940, uh, uh, before the invasion of France. And he says, we're going to have to choose. We, we Americans are going to have to choose sides. It's really a call to arms for uh, America not to stand on the sidelines. And yet, despite uh, that call, he was not shy about saying, and yet the very center of this is the way the Nazis are persecuting their Jewish minority. And I think that's really quite amazing. As far as I can tell, it took until Lucy Davidovitz's The War Against the Jews, I think it was published in around 75, for somebody to say that this was really at the core, at least an American to say this is at the core of the Nazi ideology. So this book, The Great Hatred, is his first exploration of uh, anti-Semitism. I'll only point out one other thing. We're very concerned in the 21st century. We've been trained to be very concerned about issues of cultural appropriation. I think that's that's right. I'll only say in passing that Samuel did not care about this. He was totally unembarrassed about the hyphenate Judeo-Christianity, not concerned about the supersessionist implications or the implications that maybe Judaism is being suppressed uh, or repressed and Christianity is being elevated. All these things we would now say, wow, that's really a kind of questionable cultural appropriation. All I'll say is that that's not how Samuel saw it. He wasn't worried about that. And uh, this picture, I'm sure many of you know, it's Mark Chagall's famous uh, uh, white crucifixion in which Chagall makes uh, the point artistically, I don't know how much he intended this, I am no expert on Chagall, but that basically Jesus lived and died as a Jew. That's why the, the talit, the prayer shawl, is draping uh, Jesus even as he's on the uh, on the cross. Uh, and uh, Samuel, uh, uh, you're familiar with the picture, I'm sure. Oh, no? Oh, this was, this was quite a, uh, a shocker uh, of a painting when Chagall um, first uh, displayed or whatever the word is. And actually, some people have told me, I don't know, I haven't followed it out, that my name is Asher Lev by Chaim Potok. That some people have told me that in a literary vein, Potok was trying to wrestle with the same kind of cultural issue of how do you take a literary form, the novel, or let's say a visual pictorial art in from a tradition of Jewishness, okay? In any event, the uh, standard version of the roots of anti-Semitism in the Christian world during Samuel's lifetime focused on the passion and on the death of Jesus, certainly the charge of deicide is a heavy one. It, if you can kill a god, you can do just about anything. It's a very serious charge. Um, but Samuel said, no, the real issue is not deicide, it's Christophobia. It is the Christian world's repressed resentment at their knowledge that Jesus and all the disciples and most of the early Christian authors were Jewish. And therefore, it's the birth and upbringing of Jesus, even more than the crucifixion of Jesus, that is the source of the Christian Jewish problem. And he took that one step further in The Gentleman and the Jew and uh, basically argued that Christianity has this problem. It's animated by a Jewish impulse, but it inherited a Greco-Roman world. And the pagan part of that world, which 
Samuel thought was a, a good representation of what he called the fourth philosophy, a lust for power, domination, uh, uh, enslavement. He said Christianity is the heir to both of these traditions and it doesn't know how to reconcile them successfully. And so I'll go one more sentence on this theme. He said, the, he writes about this in a few places. He says, when I went to the church in Manchester, I heard almost the same message that I heard from my rabbi when I went to the synagogue. He said, but when I went out onto the playground, I saw that an entirely different set of rules applied. And in his view, those were the real rules, the rules of the gentleman, the hunter, the rules of the uh, sportsmen, which he felt were really alien from Judaism. And the problem in his view was that Christianity had these two traditions that it couldn't thoroughly work out. And now I see I'm really running out of time, so I'll just go through this rather quickly and say, uh, and, and here again, you can read for yourself, so I won't read it, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Like a lot of thinkers beginning in the 19th century, maybe even a little bit earlier, but certainly in the 19th century, there was a lot of a very Europeanist tendency to divide the world into Israelites and Greeks, right? Greeks and Jews, everything is Hellenic or Hebraic. And uh, Samuel is part of that, and he's saying, there's this, this Greek world, competition, dominance, violence, glorification, and there's that ethos, and then there's the prophetic ethos, and the two are really at opposite ends of the spectrum. He's a terribly essentialistic thinker by our modern 21st century standards. And that's clear. I mean, look, he's a century from, thinker from the 40s and 50s. So we're going to find some of what he says out of date. Obviously, if he had gone to Ebbets Field in Brooklyn or the Polo Grounds or Yankee Stadium, he could have seen plenty of Jews screaming their heads off in delight at sporting events. And obviously, um, you know, uh, if he had really thought about it, um, uh, Jews enlisted in disproportionate number in the Second World War in all of the Allied armies. And so there's no reason in the world that Jews couldn't be um, sportsmen, soldiers, what have you, all of the things that Samuel basically put into the category of pagan or neo-pagan. But, uh, and you can see the quote here, as he sees it, there remains a central divide between what he would just call a pagan or neo-pagan ethos, uh, the neo-pagan being exemplified by the Nazis, and a prophetic uh, ethos exemplified by Judaism done right and Christianity done right. And that's, uh, again, that's a sort of a, a, a simplistic dichotomy, but one that I think has... It, it, it has some it, I think it has some, some, some merit, and I think his focus on uh, Jesus' Jewish background, I think obviously has a lot of merit. And what he said about that, I think now is now standard fare in early Christianity studies, right? No, no one in their right mind would write a book that, like of a century ago that people write, well, Jesus was really a Galilean, a Gentile Galilean. Andrew's looking at me like, I'm out of my mind. But people did, in fact, argue this very seriously, that really there was nothing Jewish about Jesus. And even if they couldn't deny the uh, genetical or biographical component, they said, well, yeah, he was born of a Jew, but he grew up in a Greek-speaking region of the country, and all of his influences were Greek. He wasn't really Jewish. Okay. Uh, trust me on this. I can see you're doubtful. <laughs> Okay, let me do uh, quickly um, two, two last things, um, and then I'll open it up. I'm happy to talk about this, obviously, at great length. Arnold Toynbee, at one time seen as a very serious intellectual and historian, now I think mainly seen as a dabbler and an, am an, an, am an amateur, he wrote this multi-volume study of history. He said almost entirely disparaging things about Jews, from the ancient Israelite civilization to modern Israel, and he was attacked 
by uh, these other New York Jews who were not charmed by his Oxford demeanor and, or his stature. I mean, you don't get to be a historian on the cover of Time magazine all that easily, but he, he made it. And uh, Samuel wrote an entire book called The Professor and the Fossil. Uh, obviously, the fossil is the Jewish people, and he tries it's not very hard, really, to show that Judaism is not a fossilized, but rather a fairly vibrant culture, and it has been from the ancient world to the modern. And uh, wherever he touches upon things Jewish, he says nothing but that which is disparaging, uh, including a misunderstanding of what um, chosenness is, and uh, perhaps even more offensively, a likening of the German National Socialists, that's a way of saying Nazis, um, to modern Israel. In other words, the worst thing maybe at the end of the day that the Nazis did was not murdering six million Jews, it was infecting modern day Israel with a desire to inflict similar pain on the Palestinian Arabs. I won't even address this. Okay, but Samuel did at great length. And this is in a book, The Professor and the Fossil, which is an entire book devoted to showing just how wrong Arnold Toynbee was. Uh, and, and this is just a fun thing I found in Cincinnati. Um, uh, this is how you turn down a dinner invitation. Uh, uh, you know, Toynbee, his publishers at Oxford University Press are gonna have a cocktail party to celebrate I guess a new version, or I forget the details of the study of Toynbee is a study of history, and they invite Morris Samuel. And uh, I won't read it because you can read as well as I can, uh, but I love the last line. I hope you will understand that my refusal of the invitation implies no personal animus toward Mr. Toynbee or disrespect toward you, which I think is obviously exactly the opposite of what Morris Samuel really meant, uh, which is uh, this guy is uh, slandering our, libeling our people, and you're a moron head of Oxford University you Press for publishing such trash. Great refusal. Um, uh, and then finally, I've run out of time, uh, uh, more or less, because uh, I don't want to lose my last, this is my next to last card, I think. Um, this is the one book that Samuel actually um, did research on in an academic way. He studied the files. We have all of his notes. He got a Russian translator to help him out. He didn't know Russian. He knew a lot of languages, but he didn't know Russian. And he re tried to recreate in 1911 the, uh, a, a, a murder case, which became a ritual murder charge uh, in Kiev. And... Um, it's extraordinarily, it's just an extraordinarily, extraordinary case of bad luck that did seem to dog Samuel. He published this the same year Bernard Malamud published The Fixer. There is no year in which you want to write the second best or second best selling book on a blood libel trial. And uh, 1960, and so to add insult to injury, Time Magazine sent someone around to interview Samuel, took some of the photos he had painstakingly collected, and then used them to write a review in which they talked 95% about Malamud's The Fixer, which is actually a great novel, and, um, and a, a couple of sentences about Samuel's uh, blood accusation, which was really a, a fine work of scholarship. and. Uh, uh, and I'll say once again, another little goodie I found at Cincinnati uh, was the uh, uh, back and forth between Samuel outraged, and I think rightly so, uh, at the folks at time. This was serious enough, and Samuel was serious enough. It made it all the way to the desk of Henry Luce, who, for those of you in American history will know, was a major figure in American letters, the longtime editor of Time magazine. And basically, Luce finally said, get over yourself, uh, Morris. Uh, yeah, we used your picture, but we mentioned your book. Uh, it is Time magazine. Well, you can read it for yourself. But here, the, the, the correspondence leading up to that are fine. So in conclusion, uh, let me just suggest uh, and some of this I want to credit where credit is due. Some of this comes, uh, some of these ideas I borrowed 
um, directly from Mark Rader's uh, new uh, anthology of Chaim Greenberg, yet another one of these New York intellectuals who kind of fell down the memory hole until Mark, uh, Professor Mark Rader at University of Cincinnati kind of, um, I hate to use the word resurrected, but I think that it's called for. Uh, and some of these are Mark's ideas, but uh, uh, first of all, just uh, so much of what these other New York Jewish intellectuals uh, said and wrote and spoke now seems so passe um, that they just haven't gotten the attention. And by the way, a lot of what they wrote was in other languages, and that hasn't helped them in the world of American Jewish histori historiography post-World War II. A lot of these guys were known, and they're not all guys, Trudy Weiss Rosemarin, uh, Mary Serkin, there were a uh, younger generation, of course, but Midge Dechter. Quite a few of these uh, uh, guys were gals, and, um, and, and, and a lot of them were known for their speaking and their public speaking, and that's how they exerted an impact, and people who remembered these people, a lot of them remembered them from their great talk. Cynthia Ozick, who I'm sure most of you have read, she was a big Morris Samuel fan. She writes about it in Art and Order. She writes about it in the um, Samuel Anthology published a generation ago. Uh, Cynthia Ozick uh, said, I used to follow Morris Samuel around everywhere in New York when I would hear he was speaking at the 92nd Street. Why well, I go there when I heard he was speaking at Cooper Union, I'd go there, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that world is gone. Uh, another reason is, of course, the um, gap between American and Israeli Jews. You know, it used to be families who knew each other, and people would go and visit for months, cousins and so forth. People had a much more immediate sense that they were, you know, with the twist of fate, they could have been killed by the Nazis, or they could have been picking grapefruit at Be Kibbutz Beit Alpha. Instead, they were, you know, professors at Columbia. But people knew that in the 50s and the 60s. Now, in 2019, that sense has largely faded, uh, and, and for good and for bad, but whatever. That connection is tied. Number four, Samuel, uh, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, and I'll just mention it again. He was not, you know, if you don't have an institution to commemorate you, you don't get commemorated. He was not a rabbi. He didn't have students. He's no Joseph Soloveitchik who ordained the thousand plus Orthodox rabbis. He was no uh, professor with hundreds of devoted students who remembered him years later. Uh, and, and, and he didn't stick with the Zionist organization, which was probably just as well. Um, uh, so he doesn't have that institutional memory on his back. And then finally, and this one I'm just going to throw out as a hypothesis. I don't think I can actually prove it, but in some ways it's my most suggestive finding. I think that in the 21st century, um, people who judge American Jewish intellectuals, that means professors mainly, um, I kind of think we, we've fallen into... Um, I won't say trap, but we fall into the mo model of judging them as whether or not they've moved the needle on American culture at large. Hence, dozens of books on Irving Howe, no books on Morris Samuel. And I wonder, is that really the right apportioning of emphasis given, uh, given the importance of what these people had to say? He falls into the other category. Uh, but I'm going to try to pull them out of it at least a little bit. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a talk about um, definitely <laughs> the more obscure intellectual who. Yes. I'm, I'm buying your idea that we should look into his work. <laughs> thank you, Naomi. You, you convinced me. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Any discussion? And, and could, they could also be comments, what you'd like to see more of, because this, this book is still in, in process. Yeah, I, I was struck by that last thing that I was thinking about Irving Howe before you mentioned it, because the, um, this thing about him being interested primarily in Jewish culture, you know, when you get into these essentialist doctrines, kind of like Gohagen, uh, oh gosh, you, you 
um, you cut off a broader context, a, a different kind of perspective, a more right. historical or sociological <laughs> perspective, and how kind of to a certain extent went almost the other direction where Judaism was kind of an affect. Uh, and he, he, he preserved his, his leftism to a certain extent. He was more yeah. political. Yeah. Uh, and moved yes, away for sure. from the, I don't, I, I think of Irving Howe as a New York Jewish intellectual, the Partisan Review and all that kind of stuff. And when you were describing um, uh, Samuel's background, I said, oh, he's some Jewish guy on the Upper West Side. He's not really into that same milieu. Well, I mean, it, it, I, th I think you're to a large degree right. I mean, I think when he hung out in the teens and in the 20s, he was hanging out largely with Yiddish-speaking uh, emigres like himself from, East, you know, from various parts of Eastern Europe. And um, he did, uh, you know, uh, uh, Meyer Weisskollen, his recollection said, when uh, Samuel got to America, his Yiddish was awful. I mean, he, he understood it perfectly well. It was the language of his home, but it wasn't an educated Yiddish because he grew up in Manchester. He went to Manchester Public Schools and then went to Manchester University. And, uh, and you're right, you're right in, the, in that he grew up in a different world from people who were born in the United States like most of the New York intellectuals were, the more famous ones. And I think that's a big difference. I think the linguistic... Um, the linguistic uh, ability of someone like Samuel to work in Hebrew, to work in Yiddish, and to work in English equally well, that is really a very different world, I think, from a Lionel Trilling or a Philip Ra you know, Rav or a Charles Reznikoff even, or, and certainly, I, if I'm not, it's a quid no better than I, but I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Irving Howe needed uh, help in the world of our fathers and the anthologies of Yiddish literature to handle the Yiddish material. I mean, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't know that language at a deep literary level the way Samuel did. So I, I, I never underestimate language or milieu. And of course, in the end, how and a lot of these guys do the prudent thing. I'm, I'm not trying to be, I, I'm coming off as critical. Really, I'm trying to defend Samuel, not attack how. Uh, I mean, I'm a professor myself, or so my business card tells me. Um, and, you know, in the end, a lot of these guys went and took jobs at universities. Why not? It's a hell of a nice way to earn a living. Uh, so I'm not going to be critical of that, but it, did, it, did, it was a different world. I mean, Samuel's world remained the world of the Jew, the Jewish world in the United States, in Sioux City, in Sioux City Iowa, in, in, in St. Louis, Missouri, in Chicago. These are the places where he went, spoke, talked to people, got feedback, uh, had inter, and it's a, it was a different world from lecturing to captive audience in uh, History 101 or Literature 101. It's really a different world that he lived in. I, I hope I've addressed that. But I, I would say it, 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 I, you could address it another way too, and I'm sorry, I'm answering this at too great a length. You remember what Gershom Scholem said famously in um, his polemic on the myth of the uh, German-Jewish dialogue. He said the Germans were always only interested in what we could give up as Jews, not what we could offer as Jews. So Scholem's conclusion was a Zionist one. I'm going to move to a place where we're the majority. But as you know, in America, for a pretty good long time, American Hebraism and American Yiddishism and American Zionism really did hang on. I don't think they still, I, I think they've let, let go at this point, but for, that was not a mythical thing in the 20th century. Sorry, Davina. No, that's okay, Ellen. Um, it, it seems like um, leaving that as you know one of your major findings or whatever means that it sounds like you're pointing the book or the purpose of the book as um, recovering him and giving him his due because people like him shouldn't be neglected. 
okay, I don't, I suggest not doing it that way because I think that, you know, that's a very, that's could be aimed at historians or, or academics and say, wow, we've been remiss in this. But you're, you're right. That is my impulse. Okay. So what I suggest instead is see whether or how he moved the needle in the discussion of, uh, that was going on at the time um, among several people who were battling with anti-Semitism and with how to handle the issue of mm -hmm. uh, Zionism or the issue of protesting um, Nazism within yeah. that time period. Because you have Kenneth Burke in, in New York in exactly the same time, yeah. and people in the Jewish area of rhetorical studies have noted that his main claim to fame is that he takes on Hitler, you know, as and talks about that, and and yet he had anti-Semitic impulses himself. Mm. At the same time, you have Karl Popper, who you have Chaim Perelman, who's uh, you know, all of these are within the yeah. you know the European intellectual milieu, who are all taking on similar kinds of issues of the force of history, yeah. whether you. Um, whether things should be done incrementally yeah. or whether, yeah. you know, whether the whole historicist outlook is yeah. wrong. And so and so if he had any impact on it or if he yeah. even is his role or his importance within um, the Jewish community or his connection to the yeah. to, to the mandate, you know, Palestinian yeah. mandate yeah. authorities and those people, you know, I would go after that. Thank you. Um, I'm attracted to that very much. I'm not sure how I'll do it, but I'm yeah. attracted to it. I did have often, I, I've thought over the last year or two when I've been working on this, he sometimes reading Samuel, it reminds me of reading the Joseph Hertz Chumash. I don't know if you guys, you'd probably have to be of a certain age to remember this. No, this was a... Used, used shows up until a few years Up ago. until, well, maybe more than a few. But in 1936, the chief rabbi of England uh, Joseph Hertz published a Chumash, and it was uh, written in the mid '30s. So the Nazism was already on the rise. It was written in with an enormous amount of hostility toward the Protestant higher criticism, which was full of anti-Jewish assumptions and presumptions. And my students, when I still taught in Cleveland 20, 30 years ago. I remember they always used to say we grew up with a Hertz Chumash and we loved it because it made us feel proud to be Jewish. In other words, one of the things that Chumash, a Chumash, you know, a, a, a Bible with a commentary, one of the things that Chumash did um, was to bolster the morale of a community under assault. And, and in some, sometimes when I read Samuel, in the 40s and 50s. That's how I, I keep thinking of Hertz. And so I'm not sure how I'll do what you suggest, but I think it's thank you. It's a good suggestion. I know, I'm sure everyone has to teach or whatever. Have you read um, Amos Oz, Judas? Judas, Amos Oz, he wrote no. Amos Oz. I know Amos Oz, and I've read it quite a lot. And the, and the character in his book, is, his name is Shmuel. Really? Judith? Yes, Judas. Oh, I have to read that. Okay, I'll read it in Hebrew. Okay, I'll, I'll. That's fine. I, I, unless this Hebrew's gotten harder, I should manage. Okay. Okay, maybe it's in. Who knows? Thank you. I would make a point of reading it. Oh, sorry, Bob. Um, he starts his most famous first book, which I noticed you've been not talking about, The Gentiles. Yeah, well. It's 1929 or something yeah. like that? Yeah, 20. And then the later books are 1950 and 1960, where you see, at least on the surface, um, out in the open, uh, a sea change in attitudes toward Jews. Um, yeah, by, yeah. You know, by American, uh, who aren't Jews, the majority. Um, and I'm wondering how, whether there's any indication, obviously, First, uh, was it his first, very first book? Yes. Okay. Well, he, he wrote a, a very bad novel oh, okay. uh, before that. Yeah. 
um, you know, you don't want to quote it. It's after all, it's uh, all I don't. propaganda. But on the other hand, um, he's writing at a time when, at near the height of anti-Semitism in yeah. the United States, yeah, uh, it really gets even worse yeah. by the late thirties, right, and even during the war, right. But then he's still writing about the subject after the war and into the fifties, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden there are popular writers, uh, Milton Steinberg, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Peace of Mind, that was Josh Liebman. Even right. Others are. It's been a, a kind of sea change. Now Jews are saying, "Here's who we are," or "Here's the way you really ought to live," and they're selling millions of copies of books. Um, what does he have any take on this? That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Okay, it's just the context. Yeah, the yeah. I, I mean, what's interesting about the the the, the uh, you know the, the people you mentioned. Uh, and Milton Steinberg was, of course, you know, really wonderful, and his basic Judaism is still a classic. I would say Joshua Lof Liebman and Milton Steinberg are by nature apologists. He's by nature a polemicist. Samuel is more, he's more comfortable on the attack than these guys were. And of course they were... Uh, okay, okay. And, and of course they were rabbis. I think that's you know, they're more officially representative. And, and part of, part, actually, by the way, the name of uh, Samuel's first very bad novel is called The Outsiders. And, but I think he thought of himself, you know, a lot of people, everyone who loves to, right, who doesn't like to be the outsider? He, li he liked to think of himself as an outsider. But I, I, you're, you're, you're right, I need, to, I need to think about that in the context of writing like that. On the other hand, can I just say, is there any Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Comments, but um, I just attended a conference at University of Florida about the Jewish 50s, Jewish 1950s. Oh. And Morris Samuel's name never came up. Yeah. And uh, it speaks to the memory hole, but it also speaks to uh, the fact that Orthodox Jews write about Orthodoxy and how it grew. Yeah. Nobody else is important. Right. Uh, Reform Jews take on the world, but orthodoxy has nothing to do with it. Um, and I think that's part of what the problem is here, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. he is, um, he's so broad in his approach right. that um, maybe there's no tradition yeah. that he fits into, I mean, in a way. I totally agree with that judgment. And, and I would just say, aside from my own um, personal affection for generalists, I do think that um, one of the things he has to teach us is that those of us who tend toward generalism or, to, or, or even, well, humanists in general, he, Samuel never, I'll credit him with never losing sight that if he wants people to listen, he has to speak in a way that isn't only for the expert. Mm -hmm. And he was very good at that, I think. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Uh, I was wondering if he wrote about the relationship between pluralism and Zionism at all. And also, I was wondering on the first slide, when you wrote <laughs> for April instead of April 4th, is that an homage to his Manchester roots? <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, strangely enough, that's just the way I date things, because I think it's more sensible. Um, uh, and, and, and without... In, without dragging you into it further, he actually grew up in, uh, his first five years were in Romania. But that's, um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, he, I don't think so. Um, he, he was really, I think he really never got over this romantic idea of chalutziut. In other words, for him, Israel ultimately was about the kibbutzniks, the moshavniks, and that was the real Israel. And that's why I think, uh, you know, in the 50s, he started writing about limiting immigration, and he never really integrated, I think, the idea that Israel, even without the Palestinian Arab minority, Israel itself was already becoming a diverse Jewish population with, uh, you know, not only the DPs, but also, of course, the Mizrahi Jews who started pouring in. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think he ever really um, fully embraced or thought about thought that through
he, 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 was, he was stuck in Kibbutz Beit Alpha or Kibbutz Chavsimah. Okay, I, I think looks like those were yeah. the questions. Yeah. Thank so many thanks Thank for you fielding very much. them. Thank you. Thank you.